Welcome to my online lecture. My name is Sascha Klotzbücher. I'm the acting professor for Chinese economy and society at the University of Göttingen in Germany. And today I want to present my paper titled Weaponizing Medicine, China's Disease Prevention and the Military Civil Fusion in Medical Research. Just share my presentation with you. Since 2016, the Chinese Communist Party proclaimed the strategy of military civil fusion. In Chinese, that is called Junmin Ronghe of research. However, this cooperation between military academies and civil universities or research institutes is not new. This lecture today aims first to discuss disease control as a part of the warfare and second, the role of the People's Liberation Army, the PLA, for medical research. I will discuss historical events from the Korean War to the recent outbreak of the COVID-19 epidemics in Wuhan. <laughs> Analyzing official documents and material from social media and looking closer in some cases, I will present the military civil fusion in its key characteristics. My motivation is to increase awareness in the international scientific community for an underestimated and overseen organizational relationship. Researchers cooperating with Chinese scientific partners or those who use Chinese sources and data should not take for granted autonomy of science in China and even more important, they should be clear about the implication of the military civil fusion. So what is military civil fusion today? We will first discuss that uh, uh, looking in some recent official documents, the 13 five years plan. Then I will briefly discuss the two dimension, what I call weaponizing medicine. There's a procedural dimension and there's a structural dimension, the procedural dimension. This is the argument says that disease prevention and epidemic control is organized like a war. Uh, so it's a kind of a military crisis intervention. The, the structural dimension looks a little bit more on the power um, distribution within medical institution in comparison also to um, military institution. And of course, we were interested in uh, the question in the medical sector, who takes the lead, who knows first, who intervenes in what. And then I will, of course, will argue that military is always at the top of this power structure. And then I will uh, show some uh, recommendations, uh, and uh, discuss how does it relate to Chinese-German academic cooperation and in general to our Western disciplinary fields and publication cultures. Military civil fusion is a strategy of overcoming the dominance of the US in conventional warfare by exploring new forms. This is something what is uh, discussed in a recent paper of Elsa Akania, and she um, discusses several um, new forms. And one of them, what is interesting today is um, what in Chinese military is um, discussed as life controlling power, so zhe sheng quan. So, and uh, Chinese research and development, this is the, the general argument, aims to integrate the potentials of biotechnology, gene editing for military applications as new forms of warfare and some kind of a militarized uh, biopower. So now let's look at the, uh, some kind of uh, official documents. And this is the special plan for the fusion of military and civil development integration of science and technology in the 13 five years plan uh, that came out in August 2017. 
So what is the, the aim of uh, this? That I will argue that basic research, cutting edge research, and also innovation, technological innovation becomes militarized. Um, so we have a kind of overall planning of the military civil fusion of science and technology. This is the, this is the message of the document. And um, they also define some key special projects. Uh, they uh, discuss integrated sharing of science and technology, innovation resources, uh, and also new forms and ways of collaborative innovation platforms uh, and so on. So let's have a quick look into the, uh, the full text of this. This is also um, published in September 2017. So as I said, uh, specific areas and corporations. Um, in here, they want to define some kind of major projects of scientific and technology mil military civil fusion. And this is, of course, what is interesting today in our talk, perhaps biology and uh, uh, others, agriculture, um, for what is called the military civilian dual use. This is another term for the more or less the same. So, Jun Min Liang, Yong. Then we have a, a national science and technology, major projects, um, for example, also quantum communication, quantum computers, and also something like brain research, brain science, um, and all these uh, things. And they also discuss the uh, how to do it. So uh, one of the key measures is strengthening the sharing on research platforms. That also means to create an infrastructure that is not exclusively military or exclusively civil, but um, it always has to be shared and there should be some kind of bridges or some kind of uh, forms on platforms how to share also this kind of uh, infrastructures like what is here explicitly said in the document laboratories, uh, scientific research platforms, centers, uh, and so on. Uh, so promote the sharing of basic scientific and techno technological resources between uh, the civil and the military sector. Uh, something what is of course important for us as foreigners, there's also a special section on international expansion and integration of foreign researchers. So what is our role as when we ask? So here it is said to encourage cooperation with internationally re-owned scientific research institutions to set up research and development institution overseas, not only in China, but also overseas, to establish, to establish a number of joint research and development projects with countries that have innovative advantages in related fields. And again, uh, create some platforms for this kind of international exchange and uh, uh, also, so what is, uh, I, would, I would argue, so besides of going out for transfer of knowledge that we already have in, in forms of scientific cooperation and also in forms of espionage, uh, there is a new dimension of buying in and attracting, attracting established leaders in the respective field into research settings that are controlled by Chinese partners. So foreign expertise should also have the potential to be used for military purposes. So if we wanna sum up that, so what is it? Jinmin uh, military civil fusion. Uh, or some kind of a dual use, Liang Yong, is an explicit part of knowledge production and techno technological innovation in the People's Republic of China for defined strategic areas and fields. Uh, there also should be a kind of new research uh, architecture that facilitate this kind of fusion, this kind of sharing by hubs and a platform. And also what is important, it's not only about applied science, but we also have basic uh, research. And the new dimension of buying in, 
explicitly, of course, and attracting leaders in the corresponding academic field abroad for the construction of world-class uh, research centers. So in, what can we learn out of it? I would say that it's not scientific to talk about technological innovation in China, leaving out the PLA, because the PLA is always part of that technological innovation in form of, the set, as I said, the, this overspanning paradigm of military civil fusion. Uh, so there are new structures, uh, new, uh, also uh, we, the foreigners also part, but also we have clear boundaries and this becomes very clear if we look, for example, into the uh, research on the, the virus, the uh, research on the epidemics, and there came out a recent, um, uh, a recent document by the Ministry of Education that said, uh, all publications uh, the, that are uh, uh, prepared for submission uh, in journals or some kind of data that is um, prepared for sharing should uh, you need some kind of a confirmation by the Ministry of Education. So we have, as I said at the beginning, a fusion of research and sharing on Chinese controlled platforms, but in, we also have a clear restrictions on outflow and circulation of data and findings outside China. So even something like here, medicine or uh, virology uh, has, all, uh, has also an ideological power because if it is uh, confirmed, it has to be confirmed by the Ministry of Education. That also means it has to be confirmed by, uh, at the central level and also by the uh, Chinese Communist Party. Now let's look at the, uh, what I call the procedural perspective of epidemics control of disease prevention. Uh, we will look into the uh, uh, Korean War and also the recent cases of, uh, in uh, Wuhan. Uh, what is so uh, interesting about the Korean War, because the Korean uh, War in the, the beginning of the 50s established a kind of a rhetoric figure that we are very familiar uh, in these days. Um, during the K Korean War, there was always the allegation of the Chinese military that there is a kind of a American virus, um, that American army um, uh, or air force has dropped some kind of uh, animals, insects, um, um, with a virus as a kind of a bio uh, warfare. And um, we know that um, this kind of uh, rhetoric figure, um, we also saw it at the uh, other side in, in, uh, in the US uh, recently, I think about China virus, CCP virus, but I think it's so, um, it's, uh, we can understand why the Chinese have picked up it uh, also in the same way that said um, uh, at, in, at the beginning in, in March, the um, uh, officials uh, accuses you social of bringing a virus into Wuhan um, uh, because uh, this is a kind of a established uh, rhetoric a figure that we have um, already in China since the 50s. We also uh, have in, in the 50s, in the Korean War, um, the kind of wording like the people's war against uh, the enemies. Who is the enemy? Of course, uh, it's the uh, insect or it's the transmitting animal um, that should be eradicated. Uh, um, so, and this is of course interesting that um, all these epidemics control disease prevention always focus on the eradication of a kind of an animal and not on a um, more of these, um, uh, what, what was also discussed um, in the 50s, um, the containment of infected uh, human uh, population. And this is, of course, a kind of a concept that we also can see uh, in the national health campaigns. In there were uh, a lot of uh, campaigns um, in the rural countries, uh, in the rural uh, areas in uh, China. And what is another characteristic? There is a kind, it's a very low um, institutionalized approach. We always have ad hoc task force. Uh, and also, who is not in charge? It's who is not in charge? The, the Ministry of Health is not in charge of epidemics control. As I said, because this is, was always a military 
issue. And um, when, of course, there is no war, uh, who takes over um, this kind of ad hoc uh, intervention? Uh, it's the party, uh, because, you know, uh, there are two institutions. We will discuss that later in the 50s until the 70s, the party, of course, and uh, the, the military. So the party took over epidemics control, also these national health campaigns. They had more or less nothing to do with the Ministry of Health, but party commission and very well known are also led by uh, Joe and I, as, um, as other scholars have discussed in uh, detail. Uh, what is also part of this military crisis intervention in China is not only, it's not only a fight, but there's also the massive propaganda. Uh, uh, okay. As I said, disease control, epidemic control is, is uh, what we see uh, some kind of a martialization. Uh, and we also, as I said, we have the legacy to organize it outside the medical bureaucracy all outside the civil and medical institutions. This is very important. We have some kind of a time limited medical crisis intervention organized by military or militarized forces in warlike settings. And if we have understood that, um, then if we look into the Wuhan case and what happened in Wuhan, this is exactly more or less the, the same pattern how it works. So we first have uh, um, some kind of a, uh, a war against the virus. And uh, when there's a war, of course, the, the military comes up and the military takes over. So the civil administration steps down, the military takes over. 23rd uh, January, um, the army enters uh, Wuhan. We have some kind of a, a warlike status. We have national security status, um, a complete lockdown of the city. Think about the city as a battlefield uh, that has to be uh, prepared. And now the, the army proceeds on, the, on this kind of battlefield. And of course, what is part of the preparation, you first have to get rid of, you have to, have to clear off the battlefield from all these non-cooperating, uh, civilians, and there have been also a lot of cases, Fang, Fang Bin, uh, Chen Jiu Shi, all these people who are critical about what happened, they have been quarantined, uh, more or less, so the quarantine is also a kind of a, a new a prison where people were just um, uh, taken away. And what is also part of a war, of course, a war economy, and to set up a military infrastructure. Yeah, we have coupons in Wuhan, we have a general centralized distribution of raw and essential goods. Think about the mask. Of course, they are not, uh, uh, they are also distributed not in, in these civil uh, ways. Think about the shops or something. No, it's the Chinese Red Cross uh, that distributed uh, the mask. Uh, we have, of course, we have a lot of hospitals in um, Wuhan, but the PLA, they also built their own mobile uh, hospitals and also the, it's the PLA that sent in one, at least 1,200 um, medical personnel from their mili military hospitals in other regions of uh, China on the February the 3rd. And also what is also part of this lockdown of this kind of um, uh, military crisis intervention, uh, as I said, uh, propaganda and um, uh, propaganda and uh, uh, control uh, of the social uh, media. So when the war is over, um, that was um, organized by the, the, by the military, by the army. Of course, the emperor um, uh, uh, steps, uh, steps back for a moment. Perhaps uh, he goes into the bunker and when the war is over, when the battlefield is cleared again and there's some kind of a victory, then of course the emperor comes uh, back. And this also act, uh, exactly happened, happened in Wuhan, you know, March the 10th. Uh, this is the day when uh, Xi Jinping um, showed up in uh, Wuhan, um, of course, in a, in a kind of a orchestrated uh, propaganda show of a victory, uh, how they conquered uh, the virus. So, 
So if, if you if you understand this kind of intervention in, as I said, as a war, um, of course, it makes sense that uh, Xi Jinping um, um, did not show up because, uh, the, as I said, the emperors or the civil leaders only show up when um, when the battlefield is is clear and there's no danger uh, anymore. What happens when uh, the war is over? There is a kind of a statue of what I would call the post-war. Um, and uh, we still have some kind of a control of epidemics, um, but not so uh, directly by the PLA. And also part of this epidemics control is also the, 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 con the surveillance and uh, the stability social to, uh, sustain uh, social uh, stability. And this is also what we can see, for example, in some kind of documents. Here, the document of a leading group of control, SARS-CoV-2 of Baoding City in, uh, uh, that's in Hebei province. And what you can read here is um, where you can see clearly that control of epidemics and um, surveillance and uh, control, the social situation is part um, is uh, put together. So epidemic control is always uh, also to control the social stability. And quote, what is, the, uh, what, is the, what is the aim? Quote, coordinate the normalization of epidemic protection and the maintenance of social security and stability, unquote. <clears throat> so we have uh, a ret retreat of the People's Liberation Army, the PLA, after April the 8th. And of course, then, uh, changing forms of surveillance, parcellation, and distribution. <clears throat> when civil rights are already undermined during the military crisis intervention management, the post-war period tries to keep up this level of surveillance and restrictions in non-military settings. And of course, what, in, what becomes important in uh, Wuhan, this is the, the kind of the, uh, the digital uh, dimension uh, the health uh, codes, these kind of new new apps. But what, of course, war or post-war, this is, of course, a pattern what we already have seen in other regions like uh, Xinjiang. Uh, so what happened in Wuhan, I would say, is more or less a kind of a Xinjiangification of, uh, a govern uh, of governance. Um, think about that there was a kind of a, a riots in uh, Xinjiang. There was an internet shutdown. Um, a partial uh, lockdown, heavy restrictions of mobility, there was some kind of a checkpoints, um, and this situation became, became even worse 2017, when there's some kind of a broader containment, parcellation, concentration camps, and also 2019, um, we heard about these uh, reports about mandatory apps, apps for the Uyghur population for, of course, the control of their mobility to track people uh, what what they are uh, doing um, in Wuhan the, the 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 pattern is a little bit different why um, we have of course in in January as I said a kind of a complete lockdown of a uh, city and of course the surrounding also the surrounding uh, cities um, but we had no uh, internet uh, shutdown like in Xinjiang Xinjiang it was 2009, I think, um, three months. Why not in Wuhan? Because the internet is already part of the surveillance. This is why they cannot they cannot shut down the internet uh, because they need uh, now the the smartphones, the apps as a part of tracking people, surveying people. Um, and this is why they did not shut. Why why they will never shut down um, the internet again, as in Xinjiang, because they didn't have these kind of apps. Um, 10 years, 10 years ago. So, what is crucial for the surveillance in Wuhan? Uh, it's the health, the so-called health code app. You know, in China there are very different um, uh, health codes. Let's only look at the this one. What is uh, what has been used in Wuhan? It's like a an ample. You have red, yellow, green. Um, and as I said, uh, now it's not the the PLA or some kind of. Uh, um, uh, local security that completely locks up, um, shut down the city or the streets, but there is some kind of security officer. You have to show your app and the more or less the app decides or the app shows if you, if you can get out or get in. 
uh, and also of course tracks and documents uh, your uh, behavior. So uh, is health checking a kind of a automated tyranny? Uh, as I said, because um, it uh, at that moment when you uh, when you have this kind of the red color in your app, that means you are completely uh, locked down in your apartment or in in another place where you are. You know, there are also cases in one hundred people where just uh, sitting uh, in a in a bus and they could not even get out uh, of the bus anymore uh, and then of course the police came and uh, they have to make some kind of uh, arrangements <laughs> so what is the app about let's uh, have a look here what you see uh, i would argue this app is about self-observation and surveillance here please uh, what is written here in the app please comply with regulations actively cooperate with temperature testing and other nuclear tests and then the, yeah, there's a kind of a display of your test results um, and um, so uh, the health code app is um, is a part of a surveillance regime uh, as Tivert uh, um, uh, uh, coined it um, and I think it becomes very clear if we compare the Wuhan health code with the German Corona warning app, if it functions. Uh, recently, there, there has been some uh, reports that uh, this kind of app did not work at all. But anyway, let's only look at the, the, the let's look at the function. Uh, what, what can the app do? Um, what is the design? And uh, what we see, of course, in China, that the health code uh, is mandatory. The German app was or uh, is voluntary. The Chinese one connects uh, to a server. The German one is a kind of a Bluetooth connection. And uh, the Chinese one, it controls your own body of the, of the owner and documents and auto assess your behavior. As you said, you see, you always have to uh, uh, key in something, uh, your temperature and all these things. But the German egg, uh, here, that's very different. The German app, app provides only information about the environment or the, 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 the environments and the risky contacts. Um, so um, it does not provide information to anybody um, about your health status or about your body, but uh, it makes the owner more competent in self-assessing the potential risk of the uh, present and past contact. So it gives you in some kind of additional information about the environment, about the environment where you are moving. So something, some part of information that you cannot see or you cannot hear. But the Chinese, the Wuhan app is, enables the state to control and block the owner as a health threat and a political challenge uh, to others. At that moment when you're a political challenge, when you are a health threat, you are just locked up in your apartment. So, um, as I said, war, post-war, there is a kind of a complete lockdown by the PLA in April. Um, we have a kind of a partial uh, lock-in uh, by, uh, by uh, digital means, by the health code app, uh, and what is now beginning, a collection of biometrics without consent of the population. They're still going on, the parcellation, continuing checkpoints, uh, the complete control of mobility by apps yeah? because you are you are uh, the app tracks you completely uh, where you are where you go uh, where do you uh, when do you get in the bus or when do you get in the, in the metro when do you get off we also have a different form of uh, economy uh, now we have has come what is coming up uh, some kind of a vendor economy and what is also st now still uh, part of the post-war period is also the, the heavy, the massive propaganda that we also have seen in other parts. But of course, the, the, the system is very flexible. You can also uh, come back to a kind of a com complete lockdown um, very easily, as you see here in, um, in the mid-May in Wuhan, that of course some parts, uh, some communities could also be uh, uh, locked down very easily that you, um, in a more traditional means, you just um, here um, close um, close uh, the gate and nobody can can uh, uh, come in and uh, go out. Okay, that's what that was the pro procedural perspective. Now let's look in the stru structural perspective. 
And of course, this is the question of, um, we seem to have two separate entities of, if we, and when, we, when we talk about the medical sector, there is a kind of a, a civil sector, civil hospitals, uh, you have the universities, uh, uh, medical research institutes, and you have a kind of a military uh, med medical acad academies and military um, hospitals. And the question, of course, is, uh, is it only some kind of a parallel structure or is it also uh, with the same rights? Or um, so what is the, 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 the distribution of power between these both? So, so the crucial quest question is, as I said, who takes the lead? Who knows first? Who knows more? And let's uh, first look uh, again into, um, uh, into history, into what has done uh, Tu Yoyo um, during her research in the, in the 70s. Um, and then also let's go back to uh, SARS and COVID cases again. And then also we will look into quickly who controls uh, laboratories um, uh, and also um, the kind of international perspective, um, who takes the lead, uh, who can uh, do what. <laughs> okay, first, uh, Tu Yoyo is um, the first um, Nobel Prize winner for uh, medicine and physiology in 2015. Uh, I, don't, I will not talk about uh, what she has done. I think everybody uh, knows it. So what was her affiliation? Uh, her affiliation was the, the Institute of Materia Medica at the Academy of Traditional Chinese Medicine. So she was more or less part, um, if, if we, so what, is, what was the cluster? Of course, part of the Chinese Ac Academy of Science cluster. So it's not a military uh, organization. But even if you look at these two, two pictures, you see this is um, one picture from the 80s. I think this is um, Paul Unschuld when he visited, um, he made this photo when he visited um, Tuyo um, in, um, in the beginning of 80s. And this is a more recent one. And there even you can see that Tuyo, she has a military badge here. So um, where, did it, where does it come from? Um, of course, um, what, what was the background that, um, I would, uh, I will argue that, of course, even that the two-year-old -year case, um, and during that time, the military, of course, with a party, what was the dominant and the most powerful organization uh, in China and controlled more or less everything. And this is also, of course, that they controlled uh, medical uh, research. And this is, of course, the context that we also have for two-year-old's uh, research. Um, you know, the Vietnam War, uh, Ho Chi Minh uh, contacted Mao Zedong because he said, uh, you know, a lot of my soldiers, um, they are not uh, wounded in the battlefield, but uh, they, they, got, uh, they got sick uh, uh, um, or infected by malaria and they, they could not fight anymore. So we have a lot of losses. Um, uh, could you help us to reduce these kind of losses? And of course, Mao said, yeah, I, I can do it. And then this was the, the historic background of the so-called, and at that time, secret project 523 uh, or 523. Um, um, and they began to um, make some kind of a research about um, anti-malaria, um, a vaccine or um, uh, uh, some kind of uh, a drugs um, and um, but they they don't really um, um, uh, succeeded and in 69 they try to open up and increase uh, the, the number of researchers and this was the moment when also Tuya Yo uh, could uh, join in so this was a, a huge uh, research consortium, consortium of 500 scientists um, that work on, on um, uh, this issue. So the PLA, we could say, brings together a large number of research researchers and research institutions, and also to the Yo from the, from the uh, Academy of Traditional uh, Chinese Medicine as a part of a military uh, project, and also um, uh, uh, let's see how Tuya Yod uh, describes uh, her integration into the project. Quote, in 1969, two directors and another member of 
from the national five to three office, visited the Academy of Traditional Chinese Medicine and the Institute of Chinese Materia Medica, seeking help in searching for novel remedies among Chinese medicine, unquote. And some uh, sentences later, quote, after thoughtful consideration, the Academy's leadership team appointed me to head and build a project five to three research group at the Institute of Chinese Materia Medica. My task was to search for anti-malarial drugs among traditional Chinese medicine. So this project in contrast to many others became um, non-classified and uh, there are a lot of publications about this uh, project in China as you see here and of course also in um, Western scholars uh, uh, wrote about it. So the military um, initiates, uh, intervenes and also assigns new tasks to the uh, to the researchers in some kind of civil research in, uh, institutions uh, very easily. Um, and now let's, let's see that, and now I will try to argue that this kind of pattern um, uh, repeats uh, and comes back again um, on, on um, during the SARS epidemics. And uh, there was also a kind of a military crisis intervention that substantially changed everything. Um, and of course, if you want to um, look into this, there's one name that is very um, prominent, and this is um, the, the medical doctor Jiang Yen Yong from the Hospital 301. Of course, Jiang Yen Yong is not only a medical doctor, uh, but he's, uh, um, uh, he's a major general. Uh, and what is the Hospital 301? Of course, it's the general hospital of the PLA. And this here um, on the right side, you can see a picture, a, a picture of it. So a kind of a hospital that is also at that time already engaged in kind of um, research on these um, vaccine on on uh, virus. So um, he, um, this is very crucial to understand uh, why he could have such an impact. So what, what, what was uh, his impact or what have he done? He only uh, he, uh, wrote a kind of, uh, an email to the Hong Kong broadcasting station and um, said that the numbers of the infected people, um, that's not correct in our hospital, we have much more. And, and also um, it seems to be that it's a virus and not, um, uh, not the existing paradigm what the Ministry of Health, uh, Zhang Wenkang said. Um, so, um, he dared uh, to challenge the, the existing paradigm or the existing explanation what SARS was. And as I said, um, it's so crucial uh, or it becomes clear that, that he could say it because in this kind of top down um, uh, bureaucracy, when of course the, the, uh, the boss uh, of this um, medical um, uh, uh, he, uh, he as a minister of health when he said it is uh, not a virus um, we have to do this and that uh, nobody nobody dared uh, to challenge it but only some people who are completely outside that structure uh, they could challenge it because simply Jiang Yen Xiong's boss was not Zhang Wen Kang because uh, Jiang Yen Xiong was part of the military he was a military rank uh, officer and uh, um, so he um, this is why he challenged he was able to challenge it knowing that there will be what kind of some kind of consequences by uh, Zhang Wen Kang or by his bureaucracy because simply he is not part of the of that bureaucracy. Interesting is also think about he's part of the military sector he also does not come communicate in kind of academic journals or in academic journals or some with publishing uh, uh, medical papers but as I said he used a little bit strange so it, it looks a strange way but of course it's not a strange way uh, for him at all because he uh, never published any uh, have any, uh, uh, any papers he's uh, so this is why he uh, used for example uh, the uh, writing an email that had such an impact um, so after his intervention, after this military intervention, let's say, from outside into the 
into the civil medical sector, a lot of things changed. The Ministry of Health uh, has to resign. New direction in researching SARS. Uh, the numbers of infected have been uh, corrected. Different measures were taken. And of course, a new kind of propaganda uh, and war against the virus uh, began. So what can we learn out of uh, this is that um, there are clear hierarchies of intervention. It's, it's the military that can intervene into the civil sector, but there are no cases that the civil sector intervenes into the, into the military. And there are not only hierarchies of intervention, but there's also hierarchies of knowledge. So and of course here the, cool, the crucial question would be, who knows more or who knows first? Let's look at this question and uh, going back to uh, Wuhan in uh, January. Uh, and there was a, a university, the Naval University of Engineering in Wuhan. And of course, this, hosp uh, this uh, university is a PLA uh, university. And this you can see clearly if you look into the Chinese, um, the, uh, the, the Chinese name of this university. So, so it's clear it's uh, the PLA. Uh, uh, university. And what, what did they know uh, and what have they done that others, others have not done yet? Uh, think about on the 2nd January, um, they already published a notice on the control measures on the unexplained panomia and strict prohib prohi prohibition of foreign personal entry into the school. So this kind of measure makes only sense if you know already that there, that there is a kind of human-to-human -human transmission. Um, that you say, please, uh, um, we have to keep out um, the potential infected people from, from campus. Okay, now let's back again um, to um, uh, SARS for the question, who takes the lead? And also the question, who controls the laboratories and um, what are these kind of uh, laboratories? And um, one thing I, found very interesting, there, is a, there was an article in the China Daily um, in 2004 because um, uh, there was a small uh, outbreak uh, of uh, SARS uh, uh, again in 2004 in uh, Beijing and in uh, Shanxi. And what you see here in the English version said, there was a kind of a leakage, and this area also interesting, we have to keep that in mind, there was a kind of a leakage of a P3 lab, a, a CDC PC lab, so the, a, a laboratory that is uh, controlled um, uh, by, the cent by the center of disease uh, control and in, in, in Peking. And what is here in, in the English text is that, yeah, the, the director, he should take the responsibility and he, and he stepped back, of course, of course because he, he made some uh, mistakes. Uh, now let's look at the, uh, how it was discussed and how was it reported in um, Chinese media and also in the, the state's media, like the, like the um, uh, uh, People's Daily, like the People's Daily. There you can see, yeah, they also um, admit there was a leakage from, uh, from a lab uh, with the SARS virus in Beijing and, and Anhui. But of course, and there was also, they also accepted, this is also inter very interesting, we have to keep that in mind, they also accepted a kind of a investigation team where also the WHO was part of it, yeah. You, you see it here, you have the experts from, from uh, the WHO. But of course, now we should have a look on, uh, there was kind of an investigation team, but who takes the lead? And this is, of course, we know um, who takes the lead. These kind of people are always mentioned at the beginning. Uh, remember, we have a, um, in the English article, it's a kind of a CDC lab. Um, and what is here, the, C the CDC lab, um, it's not, it's, it's not, um, uh, uh, of course, um, uh, it, it is mentioned, but who takes the lead of the investigation team? And the, in the investigation team uh, is led by a military, uh, uh, by the military organization, by the Academy of Military Medical Science. What is the, 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 the complete 
named, so it's the Academy of Military Medical Science of the PLA, Academy of Military uh, Science. <clears throat> so they, 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 they uh, took a lead, so they um, investigated uh, and also decided what will, uh, what will be uh, investigated. So I would argue this says a lot about the real, um, uh, perhaps the ownership and also who can control the lab? Yeah, if there's some kind, if there is some investigation needed, uh, who comes in first and who takes leadership? Yeah, this I think this says something a, a lot about uh, not the the open some kind of a uh, organogram in a way uh, who this lab belongs to the CDC, but who th there seems to be some kind of a hidden hierarchies uh, who has to say something in this uh, uh, in this lab. So we have a kind of a military dominance. Um, and what is interesting, this kind of military dominance uh, is also um, uh, already, um, uh, we can see that and we can read about it in publications in Western scientific journals. Um, I only here took uh, one as an example, it's from 2008, also about the novel SARS-like coronavirus in a Chinese bed. And what you are, beds and what you can see here is that Think about all the, the the yellow the yellow one. These are all people from here from the uh, from military uh, medical institutions. Here it's the third military medical university, Chongqing, and um, uh, Research Institute of Medicine of Nanjing uh, Command. And of course, there's one foreigner from here, Stony Brook University. So there is a kind of a cooperation between the Chinese military and also uh, civil um, uh, um, in, uh, research institutes here from the West or from the US um, uh, that work uh, together. Why do they do it? Uh, so there's a kind of a Chinese military and American funding, as I said, there's also a mix, you can see here, Army Logistics Scientific Research Project and also here the National postdoctoral special aid from the National Science Foundation. What do they do? They are using Chinese genome sequence, sequence owned by Chinese military and conducting some kind of a, a genetic engineering uh, in China. Um, so there's a kind of a delegation for also from the, from the West uh, to China. And also, um, so what, what is this paper about? Of course, that they say, what was the success? They, they also could um, transform the virus from the bats to another animal host. And they talk about a new animal uh, model. So why are these, um, why do we see these kind of, uh, perhaps I would argue very problematic uh, uh, kind of uh, research between Chinese military institutions and and Western civil universities, because the China, because the Chinese and the Chinese military, they have so attractive data sets. Uh, as I said here, it was uh, a genome sequence that only the Chinese military have. So China is a epidemiological hotspot. This is why all these uh, our Western scientists they want to go to China. And also and another reason is why it's so, so, so attractive in medical science um, and uh, because I know it, it's also by personal communication with a lot of people who have done intern internship in Chinese hospitals, also in Wuhan, that you can see diseases in very developed stages without previous therapy and treatment. This is something what you, you can see very rarely, think about sexual diseases and all these things. Uh, this you can see in China and you see very early here uh, in the West, but of course this is very what, what the, these kind of people are interested in. When what is, also, what is also attractive in China for them, some kind of frequent corrections, think about organ transplantation on time. Uh, um, of course that's uh, forbidden uh, after 2005, but there are a lot of hints that this kind of practice is, is, is still uh, gone, going on. And also what is interesting, animal models, animal experiments, as I have shown in this article, um, so this kind of where it uh, took the, uh, the rats as a new animal model for um, virus uh, research. And this is of course interesting, not only, only for the 
uh, virologists, but also especially for the people who are doing brain studies and from, from, from neuroscience. Okay, at the uh, beginning, we said uh, there are some several, uh, there are some um, uh, two identities, there's some kind of a medical um, academies and hospitals, and on the other side, we have civil hospitals. And during now uh, this talk, I think I tried to argue um, uh, even uh, there, but there are a lot of knowledge priv privileges, intervention rights, there's some kind of a leadership, we can see there's also some kind of a delegation, but only from military to, um, to uh, civil um, hospitals. So, um, so that uh, our, um, there is some kind of a power hierarchy or some kind of a power asymmetry between these two both um, sectors, so the civil and the military sector. And so I think perhaps if you wanna, we want to characterize this kind of cooperation uh, in these uh, hierarchies. I would say it's more or less a kind of a medical military complex uh, because a military medical complex, they have very blurred or weak boundaries. Um, uh, as I said, uh, the military can intervene. They have privileges. They, ha they ha can take leadership. They can delegate, of course, what the civil, uh, uh, organizations do not have, or we, or we, we have not seen that. That is so. But of course, this is the consequence, or this is in line. What I said at the beginning, the military-civil fusion. Uh, but of course, what means military-civil fusion? That of course it means that the military is always at the top. They have much more power than the civil than the civil uh, sector. So they are on the top, and they are around them and of course as i said they can intervene or they can take leadership at that moment when they uh, want to do it okay um so we have uh, military civil fusion as i said with foreign institutions uh, when when we looked into the uh, into the publication and also recently um there is also a kind of international expansion of this kind of military uh, personal into the U.S. institutions. Think about this, what was also in the press. Tang Juan, she was a postdoctoral scholar at the University of California in, in Davis in 2019. And she um, was, of, uh, in fact, part of um, her affiliation was the Air Force or the Medical University, so the former fourth military medical uh, university. So that's the picture of her. And um, the FBI, FBI uh, got interested in her to, uh, for, um, because there seems to be some kind of a visa fraud. And then uh, she, after this um, FBI investigation in the end of June, she fled into the, the Chinese consulate in San Francisco um, and stayed there, stayed there nearly um, one or uh, stayed there one month until the July the 24th. And this is exactly the same day when the Houston consulate was uh, uh, closed in the US. So there, I would argue there is some kind of a uh, relationship between these cases. And this is also what is um, uh, said by others. And also what is completely in line um, if, if you remember what I said at the beginning about the military civil fusion and foreign, uh, the foreign international expansion and the role of foreign, that's also said uh, we should build up these kind of institutes and research, research hubs, not only in China, but also, in, uh, but also abroad. And this is ex exactly her case fits also into this pattern because her host, a Chinese professor, he was the director of this lab, or the, the PA, so the principal investigator uh, at this lab. And he also has a connection to this Air Force uh, Medical um, University. And as I said, uh, she's not a single case, but there seems to be some kind of a coordinated undercover outgoing by military organization in, in the US and into these US um, research institutions. They are, uh, this is at least uh, the three ones that are also documented or uh, where also the 
FBI investigation files are um, unclassified. And there's also one guy here, the Wang, Wang Xin, he also said um, there are a lot of more, I think 16 uh, of the colleagues um, who also um, are part of this kind of scheme uh, going out into uh, uh, US. What is uh, characteristic for this kind of um, going out? Um, they all have uh, fake resumes, so the CVs are fake. Uh, also, the, they have fake uh, affiliations. Um, the, cons the Chinese consulate is the contact when relation to own to the own university has to be uh, covered. So the contact this is also what you, what you can see in the, these files. Um, they could not contact the, that um, um, university directly, but they have to get in uh, touch with the consulate and the consulate contacted um, the military uh, university uh, or hospitals in, in China. As I said, it's a broader scheme. Uh, Wang mentioned 16 other schoolmates. Um, we also have all of them false answers to the FBI. Um, so as I said, there is a kind of a coordinated undercover uh, outgoing into foreign research institutes. Okay, let's uh, conclude. Military civil fusion uh, is the foundation of Chinese science in the People's Republic. Research and development is not science for science, but even basic research has to be connected to politically formulated military goals and strategies. Weaponizing, uh, as I showed, is observable in, in, a, in a procedural and in a structural dimension. Um, so the disease control is a form of a military crisis intervention. This is also how it is organized and also by military uh, agents. So there is a kind of a war and a post-war uh, governance or period. But in the post-war governance, we also have new forms of especially digital forms of control and supervision and surveillance. Epidemics control becomes part of the digital surveillance uh, regime. And uh, when we talked about the structural dimension, I said there is something uh, what I would call a medical military complex. Um, and of course, this kind of term descri describes structures with high power asymmetry Military institutions are nearly always in a dominant position. Think about knowledge, intervention, leadership, invasion, also even invasion into other countries, into other uh, civil um, medical institutions abroad, and also delegation. They can delegate uh, tasks um, to uh, civil medical institution or private companies uh, and uh, uh, and so on. Um, and also what we have seen there is um, hidden hierarchies um, with blurred boundary, uh, boundaries um, uh, and of course also some kind of sharing of civil infrastructure that also means we don't, uh, it seems so that the, this kind of lab or this kind of hospital is a civil hospital but in fact um, Inside that kind of uh, hospital or this kind of lab, there could be uh, projects financed by the military or even uh, military staff is working in this kind of infrastructure because the infrastructure is a kind of a sharing project of the, um, of the civil sector and the, and the military sector. We have this is something what we also learned, especially from Tu Yoyo's case, Project 523, large project consortiums with diverse partners in different places with different levels of exposures. Uh, tu Yoyo, perhaps she as a kind of a more civil uh, researcher at the front stage, and also she's publishing, she's communicating with the academic community um, uh, abroad, and of course, but there are also some kind of military personnel at the back and of course, these people, they have also different forms of communication, um, perhaps internal reporting. And if they really want to do something, what as the Jiang Yanyong case show, um, they intervene in, uh, in, in, different, in, a different, in a different form. Taken together, uh, uh, quote, uh, quoting uh, Raska, China's long-term strategic military programs are 
deeply embedded it in China's advancing civilian science and technology base, which in turn is increasingly linked to global commercial and scientific networks. Uh, how does uh, uh, our science community becomes vulnerable for these kind of military influences? And this is something what I just want to stress at the end, uh, the need for, uh, for excellent or for good data. Data sets from China uh, are raw capital in the competition for reputation and access to our professional, to our professional journals and co-opted networks. The need of our researchers, our, we, of, of our researchers outside China, so the need of our researchers outside China for unique data sets is the reason for the CCP's ability to control our natural science community. Promising but censored data are here exchanged for publication of opportunities in the high-ranking journals. The tendency to compromise and self-censoring of Western scientific partners increases with the quality and uniqueness of offered Chinese data. I think this, this is something very um, important, but also very problem. Uh, uh, problematic because we more or less because we need the data uh, then of course we buy in um, problematic data or even censored data and also we buy in some kind of um, influence uh, and military um, from the military uh, sector. The value of the Chinese data can be maximized in clear hierarchies or exclusive co-opted networks why? Because the, uh, this kind of data is the currency on the, on the science market. Uh, if you have uh, uh, some kind of uh, attracting data, you can sell it to a high price. That also means you can buy in into the high ranking journals. You can buy in or you can open, um, this can open the door into these kind of very close networks or these kind of co-opting networks and you can buy in your, um, uh, you can you buy you in into these kind of networks. Chinese data exchange for access to journals and editorial boards that are dominated by Western science networks. Th thus, it is rational for Chinese research institutions to keep the network closed with highly privileged access because they just bought in and they have the, the currency, they have the currency to buy in so that they are also interested in not to change it, not to open up, to keep it exclusive as it is because then they can even the next time uh, increase their kind of uh, uh, influence into these um, Western co-opted uh, networks. Their data as a strong currency extensively perform in these hierarchies and try to sustain them with ranking reports of university of universities. This is also because the ranking and all this stuff uh, mostly is coming uh, from uh, from China and the Chinese are so so fancy about uh, all these uh, ranking uh, because this kind of ranking establish or sustain a kind of hierarchies, uh, social hierarchies of journals and also hierarchies of uh, research institutes uh, and they have the value, they have the currency uh, to buy in. What can we learn out of it as uh, Westerners? Uh, I would say um, then of course the cruel question is how could we minimize this kind of impact of these restricted, adjusted and also censored uh, data sets? Um, then we have to, this is quite very logic, we have to devalue the data, so their currency. We have to devalue their data by adjusting these uh, structures. So they, um, there is no need to buy in. There should be no need to buy in. So we, we cannot change the data, but we, we at least can, can change our system and also the need to, to buy in, to get in a kind of a very closed and co-opted uh, network. So how could we de devalue it? Um, we should flatten the hierarchy and open up the editorial boards. And also we should enhance transparency of Chinese input rights and uh, behavior. Um, 
This, of course, we have to make clear and transparent what is the Chinese input. So the Chinese input uh, per se is not negative, but we should keep it transparent. We should uh, um, uh, document it and also we should check the people who get something from China and also um, check their behavior, check what they are saying um, and if they are really influenced uh, or not. Uh, and also I think that is something uh, what we all know, do not perpetuate rankings that everybody knows that um, these rankings are fake. And uh, we should uh, be more creative and also try to create our own data sets uh, we, that we are not, that we are not uh, reliable on these data sets anymore. Just some kind of a general uh, recommendations or tips. Um, be informed and don't be naive. Um, political naivety on our side um, that we, for example, assume an autonomous research and science in China can be very dangerous because uh, you are cooperating with people uh, and in projects uh, that are in fact um, organized or uh, controlled by the military. Um, and there's also um, some recent uh, papers that I just want to recommend and you can find the, the, um, uh, the references, you can find how, uh, how to find them in, the, in my reference section. And there's also very interesting uh, China Defense University trackers from um, an Austrian think tank where you also put key in uh, some, some names of Chinese universities. And here you find my references in selective literature. So um, thank you for your attention. And you can follow the Center of Modern East Asian Studies on Twitter. And there's also a website uh, with much more information. So. Um, See you soon in Göttingen.